thanks a lot, Ray and, and Joe, for asking me to come. Um, as Joe mentioned, my day job, I'm a, a journal editor, but I'm here at this meeting with my Grand Challenges Canada hat on. And um, one of the things that I've been helping them with is a proposal development resource, um, which is hosted on our website, grandchallenges.ca. Um, and it includes um, advice from uh, former successful applicants, some mechanics of writing advice, including um, some slide decks from myself, the perspective of mentors who have served as grant reviewers or, exper or experienced writers to give you their top tips, and also um, some resources on how you would build your path to scale. So for those of you who are at the plenary this morning, this is the announcement I made on behalf of Grand Challenges Canada that these resources are on the site available for you to access and, and, and share and disseminate. This is what it looks like, um, and I encourage you to um, go there. My talk today, I'm just going to talk for about um, 10 minutes to give you some general advice on effective grant proposals. You'll get a chance to talk to your program officers with more um, specific advice. But actually what I'm going to provide you in terms of guidance, I, I really feel could be applicable to a whole range of um, grant writing or indeed uh, manuscript uh, writing. So I do hope that it's useful to you. And the slides from today will be available on this website for you. I've also got some handouts for those of you who would prefer to take one home today. So I want to talk about six uh, key ingredients. Um, but the key point um, that I really want you to take from this session is that actually a lot of what I'm going to talk about um, are things that really need to happen before you start writing. Um, what exactly it is that you want to propose in your grant, why you feel it's important, why you believe your particular target funder is the right um, donor for that project. Um, this we call thinking. Um, it's best done away from the computer. You might find that most of your uh, best thinking is done while you're riding your bike to work or having a bath or um, going for a walk, etc. So my advice here is to spend as much time as you can away from the computer, perhaps keep a notebook um, so you can jot down your ideas, and really get a sense of what it is exactly you want to do before you begin to put uh, a pen to page or start clicking on your, on your keyboard. So the first um, key ingredient to an effective grant proposal is of course, many of you will have achieved, is to identify a very clear statement of need. And actually, this should be contained within a single sentence. Um, your statement of need reflects your overall project objective. It states the problem that you believe needs to be addressed. And even though your project will often have several um, related goals or objectives, you actually should be able to come up with a single um, overarching sentence, if you will. So here's one example for you. To help improve primary school children's reading levels, speed, and comprehension, we propose a novel educational program that combines reading systems training and an innovative incentive scheme. Single statement of need. To help develop journalist's ability to report on medical research, we provide a novel training opportunity to challenge common beliefs and promote evidence-based reporting. Your second um, key ingredient, of course, is an explicit link to your funder. An effective proposal will make it very clear to the person reading your proposal that it's relevant to their goals and that it matches their funding priorities. And the, the easy thing about this ingredient for all of you is, of course, that information is available for you to access. It's contained directly in their request for proposals or on the funder's website. And you really ought to not hesitate at all to use the keywords that the funder provides you in their RFP or on their mission or vision statement. Um, so as an example, a, a course that I applied for a few months ago at the NIH um, 
provided a description on the website. I printed it off and I literally used my yellow marker, my yellow highlighter to identify sort of the main key keywords that they were um, providing and, and parroted that essentially in my proposal to them. It can also help for you to look back on other projects that your funder has supported to make notes about how your project links with their priorities. And it's these notes that you can incorporate into your project proposal, recognizing that there are particular items within a grant that are more important than others. Summary items, for example. That's your covering letter, your executive summary, etc. These are the things that are most read by reviewers and funders. Um, and you should use the keywords that you've identified through this process in those items. Third ingredient, easy language. So for many of the people reviewing your grants, particularly in programs that take uh, project proposals in a very wide spectrum of science, you can count on there being many experts in your particular disease area, for example, or your, your particular methodology. But you also need to count on there being folks who are reviewing your proposal who don't have the specialist knowledge within your field that you do. So again, the good news for you is that no one knows your project better than you do. You're the expert, which should bring you a lot of confidence. But chances are there's going to be people like me who are more generalists than specialists who need to understand um, your project. So the ability for you to write in what I call easier conversational language can, can make your uh, project proposal more effective. Uh, I mean, I say write it plainly. W one trick is to, to read out to yourself your, the, the text that you produce to see if it's, it's done so. So let's look at some examples of what I mean by that. I mean, essentially, even in scientific writing, easy language means short words, short sentences, short paragraphs. Um, you really must, especially in an international environment, avoid um, jargon, cliché, figures of speech, et cetera, that don't uh, translate. And though your training will have ingrained in you um, the passive writing style, effective writing is actually in the active voice. So the passive way of describing um, this situation is that the man was bitten by the dog. The active is that the dog bit the man. In other words, the subject does the action rather than receives it. Here's a more specific example um, that you might model, where a more passive, maybe academic writing style is to say that research has been cited to demonstrate yada yada, um, and that reading problems can develop. A more active style would say that researchers estimate that up to 20% of primary school children have reading problems. Write it plainly. So how would you write this plainly? Is this one too easy? I'm sorry? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. It's no joke. People do try to write this, um, this complicated. OK, how about this one? <laughs> so that's what I mean by write it, write it plainly. I'll give you a moment to look at this. And in, in, in my example, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit. But actually, I'm capturing a lot of very frequent um, problems with, with grant writing or indeed manuscript writing, which is a sort of over-labored, trying to get every idea stuffed into a sentence that also then maybe um, overplays one's um, contribution, when it, in fact, can be said quite plainly. OK, fourth key ingredient, um, to give us some white space. Um, I want to make the point to you that many grant reviewers, um, or indeed journal editors or journal reviewers, they might not admit it, but actually a lot of them are, are volunteering their time 
um, to do a job that's all, um, often um, involves an enormous amount of time. So consider that at least for some of you, your grant reviewers will be looking at your material just before they go to bed, on the bus, on the airplane, when they're tired, etc. So we want to put our best foots forward as uh, grant writers and, and use a little bit of white space um, to allow that readability um, to be there. You don't need to fill every single space. Um, you also don't need to maximize the word limit if you don't need that much uh, word space to put across your message. And I think the careful use of um, features like bold and italics, et cetera, can be really effective with it without overdoing it. So as an example, this is the exact same text on the left and the right. This is the introduction to our proposal development resource. And you'll see just how with a tiny bit of white space, and I've made some little indents into those paragraphs, used one bold and one underline, um, how much easier it is on the eye um, to follow the text. OK. Number five, upside down triangles. Does anyone know what I mean by this? So your writing is effective when the reader knows where they're going. And the paragraph is the building block of your piece of work. So we could chunk it down to little paragraphs providing the basis for essentially our argument. Effective par uh, paragraphs begin with a topic sentence. It's similar to my um, recommendation about active versus passive where a more active paragraph begins with a topic sentence and kind of follows the sort of style that journalists use, where you actually lead with the, essentially the conclusion, and then fill up your paragraph with substantiating detail. So it looks like this. Topic sentence at the top instead of the bottom. So this will be familiar to you on the left. This is how we, we learned in, in graduate school to write, which is to say a whole bunch of stuff and kind of arrive at a final conclusion that says, therefore, we're going to do this fantastic new project. What I'm suggesting to you is that you create your paragraph so that they begin with, we propose to do this fantastic new project, and then provide the, the, the detail to follow. That makes for a more persuasive um, line of argument. OK, and finally, my sixth key ingredient, no uh, silly mistakes, which might seem obvious to you, but actually vexes a lot of, of, of grant writing. And so the point here is that most funders in the areas that we work are holding competitions for funds. And most of them are getting you know, this many proposals when they can only fund this many. So I want you, when you're putting your best foot forward, not to disadvantage yourself by having these silly little typos or mistakes that can cause, um, you know, give too, too easy an excuse for a, a, a grant reviewer to say, you know, I'm not interested. It, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's too much wrong with this. And so there are some ways um, to avoid that. I mean, silly mistakes include uh, typos. When I looked over these slides, even though I finished them a few weeks ago, this morning I found a typo. Um, having a bit of distance from your work can come, you know, can bring you back with fresh eyes. Typos, word counts that exceed the limits, page counts that exceed the limits. You know, I've seen this in many of my experiences that actually that last page or that last um, overhanging text is actually removed from your proposal before it's sent to reviewers. So, um, you know, it's obviously uh, going to disadvantage you. Using abbreviations or acronyms that are unknown or haven't been defined by you, um, and not following instructions. I mean, again, these are the sort of very basic elements of your grant proposal um, that should, should provide, you know, your first leg up to follow instructions very clearly. Probably my, my biggest recommendation for people with writing is to give yourself a soft deadline so that you can have that distance that I've referred to a couple of times. So if you're, um, if you're funding, submission deadline is December 15th, put in your mind that the deadline is December 1st. 
get everything done, put it away in a drawer for a week, and return to it. Because actually, having a bit of time away um, can, you know, sort of renew your perspective and, and cannot only just find those silly mistakes I'm talking about, but actually might bring, you know, a, a new perspective that can just make those final tweaks before you submit. Having a little bit of wiggle room before a deadline would also allow you to circulate your grant proposal to trusted um, friends and colleagues to do a little bit of peer review before you send it, before you send it to us. And I really encourage you, um, you know, to go over the instructions and, and, the, and, the, and the funders' parties again very carefully right before you submit so that you can make those final tweaks. Do we have time for a few questions if there are any? Any, any, any questions on um, the key ingredients of a grant proposal before I hand it over to the program officers? Are we going to get the um, presentation by email? The presentation is posted on the proposal development resource that I mentioned at the beginning, which you can get to from grandchallenges.ca. I've also got um, 40 copies here that you're welcome to take before you leave. Any other questions? Maybe it's just a comment. Um, many people are not um, native English speakers. I, I think this day and age is actually mandatory and to have everything proofread by a native English speaker. I, I've been working in, a, in an English speaking company in Manchester for, for many years now. And I still um, have every single important document counter and proofread by a trusted uh, uh, collaborator of mine. I, I think that's absolutely mandatory. And in some of the in some of the countries, um, they, the, uh, the people are merciless. Um, the reviewers are merciless in terms of the reviewers are merciless in terms of even the slightest. Typo, uh, as I said, but also like a grammar going wrong, they will reject it. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate your comment very much, and and I, I mean, for those of you who are, well, for anyone, but particularly those who are just embarking on your scientific careers, because acquiring grants and, and writing manuscripts, etc., is such an important part of how you advance in your career, it's very much worth developing a community of of trusted colleagues who you can share this type of responsibility with so that they're peer reviewing your work and you're doing the same to them as a as a as a as a corrective as as you've said and as a way of getting fresh perspectives on your work before you do um, sort of submit it to to prime time with your with your grant i i think sometimes we're often shy to share our work um, with others um, and, it, and it is very very difficult to take critical feedback, particularly from those who, who, who do it very bluntly. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if we think of it as an exercise to strengthen the way that we communicate our work, I think it can be very, very useful. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm a member of AuthorAid, and we've partnered with them on our resource, and I agree with you entirely. It's a wonderful resource, uh, freely available for, for anyone to participate in. No thank you. No charge. It, it, it has funding from a, n a number of international development agencies. It's run on a shoestring budget, but it's, uh, it, it is, it, as you say, an authentically matching kind of exercise. Um, and, and we definitely support their work at Grand Challenges Canada. So I would encourage you to thank you very much for mentioning them. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. Over to you. Um.